Hello, everybody. King Roger says, hey. So this video is going to be kind of piggybacking on the coronation video I did of Queen Elizabeth. Now I've done a few videos on the British monarchy. I've learned a lot from you Brits down in the comments about why you guys like having a monarchy for the most part. I know that there are some that aren't really fans of it. And this video is a Patreon request from Jack. He said, I've noticed your bafflement about monarchies in a couple of videos and thought you might appreciate this one. I'm not wanting you to take sides or anything, but it might be interesting for you to hear from an American about some of the positive reasons why democratic countries continue to choose constitutional monarchy as their system of government. So I wasn't expecting this to be an American actually, I thought it would be somebody from Europe. So yeah, it would be an interesting perspective to hear it from an American. So in the description of the video, it looks like uh, this guy is named Noah and he believes that a figurehead monarch can contribute a great deal to society, including stability and nonpartisan concern for the welfare of all citizens which is what a lot of you Brits have explained Queen Elizabeth represents for you guys. So with that said, let's go ahead and let's check out and see what Noah has to say. I am, as you have heard by now, a monarchist. And yes, that means that I support a system in which the head of state is a king. Or queen, let's not be sexist here. <laughs> now, chances are, when you heard this, this came as a surprise to many of you especially given that my country, the United States of America, was quite literally founded on opposition to monarchy. Not helping this perception is the portrayal of monarchs in the media. When many of us think monarch, we might think of, for example, the emperor from Star Wars cackling as he blasts Luke Skywalker with lightning, or perhaps the evil queen giving Snow White a poisoned apple. I've never thought of these guys. So, with all these examples, it's not strange that my ideology comes as a, as a surprise to many people. Now, I want to make one thing very clear. None of this is meant to oppose democracy. I don't support absolute monarchies of the kind found in Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states, to name a few. In spite of these examples, monarchy is not a threat to democracy. Quite the opposite, in fact. According to the European Intelligence Unit, of the 20 most democratic countries in the world in 2015, 10 of them were monarchies. And those 10 were Norway, which is the most democratic country in the world, Sweden, Denmark, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Spain. What I don't uh, sometimes understand is how they come up with these statistics of who's the most democratic country in the world, like based on what exactly. And incidentally, that number, 10 out of 20, is disproportionate with the total percentage of nations that are monarchies. But yes, even with this considered, it would be valid to ask, what's the point? If the monarch isn't going to threaten democracy, if the monarch is going to reign but not rule, what is the point of having one, of paying for one? Eight is a perfectly valid question, but fortunately for me, or else this would be the most embarrassingly short TEDx talk in the history of the institution, it is one I am prepared to answer. <laughs> Why choose monarchy? Monarchs are not only capable of coexistence with democracy. In many ways, they enhance democracy. The first way in which this can happen is that a monarch is better suited to be a head of state than any elected official. The reason for this is that a head of state is supposed to represent all of their people, regardless of race regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of religion, and, crucially, regardless of political alignment. To illustrate this difference, let's contrast the cases of the United States and the United Kingdom. American President Donald Trump was elected, and whether you support or oppose him, it's an undeniable fact that a good deal of his people, 65 million of them to be exact, fall decisively into the latter category. I can tell you this much. The people on the streets about a year ago chanting, not my president, they certainly didn't think their new head of state was representing them. Now, who can tell
tell me the last time the people of the UK went out on the streets chanting, not my queen. <laughs> As many of you have probably guessed by now, it's a trick question. It never happened. Because a monarch is neutral in politics, they are able to represent their people regardless of politics. And even in countries such as Germany, where the president uh, is purely ceremonial, they are still elected and they are still quite likely to be a politician. So their election is and will be a political issue. Another way in which a monarch simply makes a better head of state than a politician is that monarchs hold this position for life. Queen Elizabeth II has reigned through the terms of 12 American presidents as of the election of Donald Trump. This gives governments a consistent symbol, and one that, in most cases, will remain recognizable for a long time. I'd be willing to bet a fair amount of money that the average American would have a much harder time naming those 12 presidents than the average Brit would have naming the Queen. <laughs> My counter to that would be Americans have the flag and the constitution that kind of fill that role in a sense. They're inanimate objects compared to the queen, but they kind of are supposed to be that everlasting thing that we hold on to as a representation of our country. So, and I've had a lot of you Brits actually bring that point up to me as well, but he is definitely uh, talking about a lot of the same stuff that you guys have brought up in the comments. Like this. If the identity of Santa Claus were to change every election cycle, do you all still think he would be such an enduring symbol of Christmas? <laughs> Somehow, I have to call that into question. So yes, all of this sounds good in theory, but is there any actual data that demonstrates that monarchs are better at representing their people than politicians? As a matter of fact, yes there is. Approval ratings. Queen Elizabeth II has, as of 2012, an average approval rating of 90%, and there is nothing to suggest that this would have fallen since then. This number has only been approached by two American presidents at any given time. Those two were Harry S. Truman at 88% in the immediate aftermath of the American victory in the Second World War, and George W. Bush at 90% in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. In both of these cases, though, these high numbers were much more reactions to these presidents as symbols of the country, essentially reactions to these presidents acting in the same way constitutional monarchs regularly act, than they were to the presidents themselves. When it came to actual policy, both these presidents, well, the reaction to them was a bit more muted. They both have uh, average approval ratings in the mid to low 40s, and likely to be much lower without the initial spike. The superiority in approval ratings isn't limited to the UK either. According to the Netherlands Times, 70% of the Dutch people support the king, and this number is matched throughout most of Europe's monarchies. The exception to this is Spain at only 55%. But two things are worth noting. First, that this is still higher than a good deal of presidents, and second, that this number has been steadily rising since the ascension to the throne of the new king, Felipe. What all of this suggests is that constitutional monarchs are better at public relations, and therefore better at being heads of state, than politicians. But why is it so important to have a head of state that's good at public relations, that's impartial. Why is it so important to have a monarch? Well, having an impartial head of state has, throughout history, demonstrably resulted in higher stability, especially in periods of general regional instability. Take, for example, the lesson we can learn from Latin American history. Following the collapse of Spanish and Portuguese authority in the region, the vast majority of post-colonial states fell apart into a cycle of coups. Their democracies were failures. The exception to this was the empire of Brazil. Bra Brazilian governments had consistency. They might have changed, but they were still loyal to the same person. 
Emperor Pedro II. Pedro II also, it's worth noting, spearheaded the abolition of slavery in Brazil when the elite was against it. Then, in 1889, a military coup, backed by former slavers, deposed the monarchy and resulted in a period of instability, coups, counter-coups, weak democratic governments, and repression that did not end until 1985. And if you follow the news, you'll know that Brazil's democracy isn't exactly a model of stability. The contrast is clear. Latin America isn't the only example we can use, either. In the Middle East, the republics of Iraq and Syria are currently being overrun by violence and civil war after having their weak post-colonial governments, I'm noticing a pattern here, fall to ultranationalist dictators such as Saddam Hussein and the Assads. Meanwhile, the neighboring Kingdom of Jordan has been steadily democratizing since 1948 and is one of the best, if not the best, place to live in the Arab world, relatively tolerant and virtually free of violence. A monarchy for the purposes of stability might not seem all that necessary for the Western world. I mean, after all, the West is stable. The West is free of threats to democracy. And that's correct now. But it doesn't make any sense to assume that this will be the case forever. Remember, it was less than a century ago when the armies of the Third Reich seemed poised to unite all of Europe under fascism. Incidentally, the rise of the Nazis to power in Germany prompted Winston Churchill to bemoan the abolition of the German monarchy as one of the biggest mistakes the Allies made in dealing with a defeated Germany. A figurehead monarch of Germany, Churchill argues, could, uh, could have increased loyalty to democracy, the lack of which lay the German Republic. For the most part, the era of kings and queens ruling rather than merely reigning has come to an end. For this reason, it does seem to make sense to question the purpose of monarchy, the relevance of monarchy in the modern world. I hold, however, that, in, that today a monarch is not just beneficial. A monarch is invaluable. Constitutional monarchs make better heads of state than politicians. Constitutional monarchs represent their nation regardless of what political party happens to be in power. Constitutional monarchs can be, have been, and are rocks of stability in uncertain times. So remember, if you feel your government doesn't represent you, if you feel concerned about trying times in your nation, remember that there is an alternative. You can choose monarchy. All right, well, I'll have to hand it to him. It's really, really intimidating for a kid that age to get up and do a TED Talk, so I have to at least admire him for that. I think the subject is interesting to think about and theorize about for sure, because I would probably agree with him that there is a benefit to maybe having a head of state that is not political. So I suppose a constitutional monarchy done correctly could help stabilize the country, give you that central figure to kind of rally behind, pull the country together, Together. And yes, one half of America would probably like to have a figurehead to fall back on in case they just don't agree with what's going on <laughs> with the president. So yeah, it's interesting to think about. I don't think it would ever seriously happen here in the United States. We would have to completely alter our way of government, way the way we do things here. We would have to find a monarch, <laughs> you know? Like we don't even have a royal family to put in that position. I mean, we do kind of have some family dynasties that tend to happen sometimes in politics, but I don't know. It's just a completely different thing over here in the US. It would be it would be really weird to, to have a monarchy here. But I think for Europe, where you guys have had a long history of monarchies, maybe other parts of the world as well, you know, it's very, very much ingrained in your culture and your government and the way you guys do things. And so it's a much more natural thing for you guys to have over in Europe. Like I said, there are other parts of the world that have monarchies as well. Now his argument where he talks about that countries that don't have monarchies tend to be a lot less stable 
people. I don't know if that's a foolproof argument to make because, because there might be other factors at play in there. You know, it, like I said, history gets really complicated. So, but again, I don't necessarily disagree with his overall premise there. So yeah, thanks Jack for sharing this video with all of us. And I would be very interested to hear what all of you have to say about it, whether you are American or you are European, or maybe you live in a different part of the world and have a completely different point of view on it. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. I would certainly appreciate that. I do have a Patreon where I have a bunch of other videos that I don't have here on YouTube. So if you're interested in going and checking that out, the link is in the description and pinned comment along with my social media links and my Star Trek podcast link for all of you Trekkies. All of that's down there. So you can go explore King Roger here. And I thank you guys for watching as always, and we'll see you next time.